Topic 10. Roman Pagans, Tolerated Jews, Persecuted Christians Topics 10 and 11 go together, two halves of a whole. And we're going to be looking in these two topics at how Roman paganism or polytheism intersected with Judaism, which is a monotheistic faith, and Christianity, which is a monotheistic faith. Islam is not part of the story yet because Muhammad is not born until about 570 CE and receives his first revelation um, at about 610, the revelations which ultimately are written down in the holy book called the Quran. So, Roman pagans. Let's recall for a moment to mind some of the things that we covered in topic three. That religion and politics went closely together. That religion is more institutional and they were kind of more into mythology. That atheism, that is not believing in the gods, was treason. That is, it's a crime not to believe that Julius Caesar was deified upon his death. And what was happening was that it was regularly believed that emperors, when they die, were raised, something called the apotheosis, raised to the level of the gods, to the dais, if you will, of the gods. So you have these state cults um, of, of Roma herself as a god and the imperial cults as well. So if you're opting out, you're not just making a spiritual decision, you are um, committing a crime. And yet, there was also a tradition for tolerance and even syncretism for other polytheists. Remember that the Greco-Roman gods adopted the cult of Mithras from the east and the cult of Osiris and Isis, the twins, from Egypt. Sometimes they thought that those mystery cults were dangerous. They were referred to as foreign religions in Tiberias at one point as part of you know, that whole soup of megalomania and paranoia tries to re, uh, suppress um, foreign cults because very frequently Mithras, Osiris, and Isis, to use examples, had initiation rites connected to them and this initiation rites had certain rituals and words that you couldn't know about. And so that made Tiberius nervous because he thought, well, these are really um, political associations and dissenters wrapped in the mantle of spirituality and I don't trust them at the same time that everybody was attracted, right? So if you think of yourself as going to a horror movie, something terrible is going on, you might close your eyes, put your hands in front of your eyes, but then open a little space so you could see what was going on. There's the attraction and the repulsion at the same time. You're interested, but you're fearful. So along come the Jews. Well, really along come the Romans because Judaism predates the Hebrews um, professing faith in one God, Yahweh or Jehovah, predates Rome. Um, Abram or Abraham, if there was a character named Abram or Abraham, uh, probably, now wow, this is a big rough guesstimate, maybe 1800 BCE, Moses, likely 12, 1250 BCE, the Exodus um, from Egypt, and Jews have a long tradition of being monotheists in a polytheistic world. And yet they survived by cutting a relationship, establishing a relationship that's known as a separate piece, that the rules don't apply to us because we're our own category. That is, polytheistic rules can't apply to us because we are monotheists. And they were allowed to exist. They were what was known as a religio licita. Sometimes you see that shortened as a religio lista. The w licit comes to mind, right? It, it's funny, licit is one of those words that we don't normally use. We use the word illicit, that people had an illicit um, sexual affair, which always makes me think, well, what precisely would illicit sexual affair have been? So a permitted religion worked this way. You can be a good Jew and a good Roman. The Jewish leaders convinced the Roman leaders, and this would be true in the center and in the periphery as well, that being Jewish, Jewishnessness, does not prevent you from being a Roman, does not prevent you from serving the state and benefiting from the state. 
And so the deal, if you will, that was struck was that Jews would pay their taxes just like any good Roman. They promised not to cause trouble. And they would say that we will pray to our God, Jehovah or Yahweh, for the protection of the state and, in fact, the protection of the person of the emperor as well. Now, this even predates the empire. There, it would be for the protection of the state and the senate. Um, and so, basically, there is relative peace between the pagan polytheistic Romans and the monotheistic Jews from about 200 BCE to about 70 CE in one of those client kingdoms, and Palestine was one of them, right? So if you're thinking of Hebrew scripture, Old Testament, Christian scripture, New Testament, you know that there's a king named Herod who is ethnically a Jew, though he is quite secularized, and he is the king of that area that is known as the province of Palestina in, um, in Latin. And there is a community of Jews in Rome. In fact, the community of people, the one group of people that has been in Rome longer than any other group of people in history are not Christians but Jews. The Jewish community, which is traditionally centered in Trastevere, um, is the oldest community in Rome. And in fact, the most authentic Roman food can be found in Trastevere. If you like artichokes, that's where you want to go. And yet, there is a growing distrust of these Jews in the first century CE or AD. And of course, the context is what we talked about in topic eight, these bad emperors. So if you are a megalomaniac and paranoid, fill in the names Tiberius, Caligula, Claudius, and Nero here, you're going to see an enemy everywhere. Whether you're a pagan polytheist or whether you're a monotheist really doesn't matter. I'm going to be nervous about everyone. And so, specifically, we have this distrust of the Jews because of Caligula's designs on Jerusalem. Caligula gets it into his addled mind that not only is he a god, but it would be great to have a statue of himself on the Temple Mount in Jerusalem. Are you kidding me? The Temple Mount, the holiest site in Judaism, the temple that had been, there was the first temple that had been built by Solomon and thrown down by Nebuchadnezzar about 1000 to 587 BCE, the second temple which had been started by Herod a few years before the, the BCE CE line and wasn't even quite entirely finished when it's destroyed in 70. Right in there where the Ark of the Covenant once stood, and a number of people say, okay, Caligula, this is a really, really bad idea. And it's a signal to lots of people in Rome that he'd crossed the line. And not too long after that, he is assassinated. Now, there are all sorts of people who want to play all sorts of conspiracy theories here. But it does seem that it was the Roman pagan Praetorian Guard that took this as an indication that he had just gone over the edge. Um, his successor, Claudius, twice tries to expel Jews from the city of Rome. And they are expelled in small numbers, but only briefly. But the interesting thing are the dates there, that this happens in the year 41, now CE, and 50. So one of the questions is, was he trying to expel Jews from the city of Rome, or was he trying to expel Christians from the city of Rome. Take a course on early Christianity and you'll find that in the years 30s, 40s, 50s, 60s, to be a Jew is to be a Christian. In fact, one of the internal debates that takes place within Christianity is, must you be a Jew in order to be a Christian? If you are a Gentile, if you are a pagan, do you have, and you want to believe in Jesus, do you have to first become a Jew and then become a Christian? So even in what we call the Jesus community of those early believers, they weren't always quite sure what the difference was. In belief, yes, that Jesus was the Messiah, whereas other Jews said, no, he wasn't the Messiah. But in practice, what did that mean? Did you have to be a Jew to be a Christian? Claudius's decrees may indicate a presence of Christians who were Jews professing Jesus as the Messiah 
in Rome in growing numbers, and that may be the reason why he wanted to expel them, because they were stirring up trouble, at least as far as Claudius was concerned. But the big moment occurs in the year 66, extends to 70, when there is a revolt in Palestine uh, against Roman taxation and Greek sacrifices of Greco-Roman gods near synagogues, which was seen to be an act of agitation. And Vespasian sends his son Titus to sack Jerusalem well, he sends him to, to see what's going on, and Titus sends a note back, you know, it's really bad here, what do you want me to do? And Vespasian says, level the place, and he does. He throws the temple down, um, destroys that second temple, never to be rebuilt. Um, and that happens in the year 66 to 70, what's called the Jewish Wars, or the Jewish Revolts. Interestingly enough, we know those accounts from Josephus, who was a Romanized Jew, whom the Romans send to the Jews, because he literally speaks the language of Hebrew. And he says, you know, you've got to tell these people that we're just going to crush them, and we're not going to let them live. And Josephus goes and, and, and explains that to them. And the Jewish leaders say, well, OK, I mean, we're, you know, P.S., we're not sacrificing to the gods. That's just how it is. We would rather die. And of course, that becomes embodied in the last stand at Masada. Masada is a plateau high above the Dead Sea. So if you, if you go to Masada, Masada, what you do is you scramble up in the middle of the night, or you take the cable car up there. And then if you scramble up, you're full of all sorts of cuts and bruises. And that's going to be painful, because later on in the day, you go and you float in the Dead Sea. That's how you spend the day if you take the tour bus outside of Jerusalem. And it was a fortress that one of the Herods, there had been a series of Herods, one of the Herods had built so that if his own people had ever revolted against him, he could split and hide out in this high um, fortress, and that's exactly what the Jews do. This is um, up on Masada, and then, of course, they decide when uh, the Romans you know, build a camp around and climb up that they, will rather, they would rather die than sacrifice. And so a thousand Jews commit suicide, ten Jewish men kill Jewish women and children and then other men, and then they take a lottery to uh, see who will kill the other nine, and then one, the last one, commits suicide. Um, Masada has become a symbol of resistance. Um, you will also find, if you go to Rome, an arch that Vespasian built to honor his son called the Arch of Titus. If you've been in, to Paris, you've seen the Arc de Triomphe. If you've been to Greenwich Village in New York, you've seen the Washington Square Arch, all kind of the same. Not thin like the Gateway Arch in St. Louis, but big and thick, so that when you go through it, and you look up and to the right, there are sculptures in there. And if you walk through the Arch of Titus, you will see Roman soldiers carrying war booty. Specifically, you can see a menorah, a uh, candelabrum, being carried out. And I remember reading the story of an American soldier, young boy in World War II, young man, um, who was Jewish, who, when the Americans toppled Mussolini, walked through that arch and he looked up and he said, oh, he had all these conflicted emotions because they had just beat Mussolini. That was a great triumph. But he looked at that and it just kind of turned his, his, uh, his stomach. And then there's finally another revolt against the Romans. There's a small community that's left in Jerusalem called the Bar Kokhba Revolt in the 130s. And it's after that revolt is put down that Hadrian decides that he's going to turn Jerusalem into a showpiece of Rome so far away, the Aelia Capitolina, which we mentioned before. This topic is called Roman Pagans Tolerated Jews and Persecuted Christians. And now we come to the Christians. Now, there is this preconception. Remember, we started this course by saying, what are your preconceptions and how will they change? There's a preconception that Christians were murdered constantly for 300 years, every day of the week, every week of the month, every month of the year, for 300 years until Constantine comes along. Well, no. There are stages. There's the first stage is of, is of what we call relative toleration and isolated persecution. And it goes from about the time of Jesus, about 30 AD or CE, to about 150. Because across the empire, as I said, at least in those early decades, 30, 40, 50, 60, it's hard to distinguish between Jews and Christians. And when the Roman sources talk about Christians or Jews, we don't know who they're talking about because they may not have known who they were talking about. But the first time that we can kind of separate out that it's Christians 
as Christians qua Christians who are being persecuted for their Christian faith, not just for monotheism, is Nero's persecution in the aftermath of the fire. And of course, we have these horrible stories that Nero wanted to walk through his gardens at night and so that he would light up the bodies of Christians because human bodies burn slowly because there is fat on a human body. And also there are stories that Romans were killed in the Colosseum. We're not quite sure whether martyrdoms did take place, although every day, every Good Friday um, in, um, in Rome today, uh, for many decades, the popes have been doing kind of a Stations of the Cross devotion, and there's a cross set up in the Colosseum to represent that Christians probably were um, thrown to the lions there and elsewhere. We also have this interesting exchange between an emperor by the name of Trajan, remember Trajan? And a governor named Pliny the Younger around the year 112. And it's part of a larger correspondence that indicates how closely the emperor was involved in local affairs. But Pliny writes these letters to the emperor, and he says, I, you know, I don't know what to do with these people. Uh, you know, the problem is the more I kill, the more there are. And so how do you want me to deal with them? And interestingly enough, Trajan says, go slowly. He gives what we would call due process and civil rights to Miranda rights, if you will, to the Christians. So Trajan writes to Pliny, if somebody says they're a Christian, ask them, are you sure? Do you want to think about that again? Why don't you take some time to wonder about your answer? So don't go off and just kill them. Give them a chance to at least say they're not Christians. Second, he says, do not allow any anonymous accusations to guide your actions. Don't go after anybody who was accused anonymously. I think that's remarkable. And make sure that if they go on trial, you follow all the usual rules. And then, if they say, I am Christian, and the witnesses are authentic, yes, then you may kill them. So stage two moves from this relative toleration and isolated persecution, and I think we can say that Trajan's letters indicate relative toleration, into a second stage where things get bigger. Um, episodic, organized persecutions from about 150 to about 310. This is where the persecutions become uh, larger. They're not just on the local level, but they are um, given uh, an order, an imperial order from the center to the periphery, and they're a bit more large scale and organized. The common charges against Christians, and sometimes against Jews as well, is that they engaged in cannibalism because they ate the body and drank the blood of Jesus. Incest, that they loved one another as brothers and sisters, that they were a mystery cult because they underwent an initiation of a baptism, and that they were guilty of atheism or treason. And there's, rather a, a, there's a variety of ways that people defended themselves using the Jewish model that I could be a good Jew and a good Roman, I can be a good Christian and a good Roman, and a number of what we call apologists say that. Now, apologia doesn't mean apology. Gee, I'm sorry I did that. Apologia is a Greek word that means defense or better yet, explanation. Let me explain what's going on. And some apologists go that route to say, listen, no, no, we, we are good Romans. We believe in a lot of the things that you believe in. We believe in virtue, not vice. We want stability and order. Um, we want to raise our children as good Roman citizens. Others decide to go in the other direction and they denounce Roman paganism as uh, immoral, as decadent, as full of vice. Look at the Greco-Roman gods. They're acting just like human beings. These are not models. They're very different than our god named Father, Son, and Spirit. And as a result, there's this very famous line that the blood of the martyrs watered the seeds of the church. And this is the period of time I think that people think of when they think of Rome and Christians. It's this period, 150 to about 310, of these um, episodic, organized, fairly large-scale um, persecutions. In fact, in the year 201, it is made a capital crime, a crime punishable by death, to convert to Judaism or Christianity. Interesting. 
that still maybe in some people's minds to be Jewish is to be Christian, to be Christian is to be Jewish, at least in Roman minds. And the second is that the issue really is monotheism as opposed to polytheism. And the worst of these persecutions are under a series of emperors named Decius and Valerius in the middle of the third century in a window of about 249 to 260, which sometime appear in books as the Decian, use the adjective Decius, the Decian or the Valerian, Emperor Valerius, Valerian persecutions, and then one around the year 300, 303 to 305 to be precise, under Diocletian, what is sometimes called the Great, capital G, um, persecution. The interesting thing is that we have these accounts in Carthage, in Spain. So Christianity is all over the place, all over the Roman Empire at this point. Why? Uh, there's a saint in Catholicism called Jerome. Jerome is the person who translated the Bible into Latin, the Vulgate Bible. And Jerome said that Rome was the preparation for the gospel, and he specifically talks about the roads. He says Christianity walked on the roads of Rome, another example of ideas being an information, roads being an information superhighway for ideas. And we believe that there were some soldiers who were becoming Christians as well. See, it was pretty hard to be openly a Christian and be a Roman official. Why? Well, to be paid, for instance, if a Roman soldier is going to be paid on Friday, I just made that up, I don't know whether it was on Friday, you had to go in front of a statue of the emperor and put a pinch of incense um, in front of a candle and then you would receive your pay because you were honoring the emperor as a god and remember that the statue itself was believed to be a god, not just a representation of a god, it's pretty hard to take oaths to the Roman emperor as a judge or a praetor um, or a quaestor. So that we believe that there were a lot of um, Christians who were underground Christians and that Christianity was practiced more openly among women and children and certainly slaves because there's an attraction there um, to uh, Christianity because Christianity says in, its, in some of its letters, Paul says in some of its letters, there is no slave or free, there is no man or woman within Christianity. It's, it's democratic, lowercase d, um, in that sense. And so in some places we know that bishops were told, you must hand over the holy books. And in North Africa we actually have accounts of them handing over cookbooks. Now, is it because the people who were receiving the books didn't know what was there, couldn't read it? Or was it because there was a wink and a nod because you knew that that soldier on Sunday privately, quietly in the back room of somebody's house attended a Eucharist? It's interesting to note that persecutions of Jews and Christians go directly with bad times and that the worst persecutions occurred when the economy was tanking. So the economy of Rome is declining about 180 to about 280, and what do you find around 250, the worst of the persecutions? The frontiers are failing so much that the so-called barbarians, the non-Romans, are being paid off so they wouldn't invade. There is a return in the third century of those bad emperors of the first century, these immoral and unstable emperors in the military becoming more powerful. In fact, it's so bad that from 235 to 284, we have what are called the barracks emperors. In the space of 49 years, we can count the names of more than 50 emperors, pretenders, and usurpers. Of these better than 50, half were soldiers and half die violently. And is it an interesting that this is the time that Christians and Jews get scapegoated at a larger scale. Isn't that something that we've seen in history again and again and again? And at this point, the empire is getting so big to pick up something we said in a prior topic, Diocletian sets up that tetrarchy. And that tetrarchy is supposed to work. You're supposed to have an Augustus and a Caesar in each side of the empire, an Eastern and a Western, a senior and a junior, Augustus and Caesar. The Caesar is supposed to be in training. What happens? You almost immediately get civil war within East and West and versus East and West. And then Constant Constantine decides that the East looks like it's going to be more interesting and he's going eventually going to move his capital to Constantinople at 330. And so right on the edge of the Diocletian or Great Persecution, which ends in 305, it sure looks like Christianity might be on the brink.